Now, the latest on a big story that News 4 Investigates first broke about a year ago. It involves a bounty hunter raid that terrified residents of a South Buffalo duplex. One of those bounty hunters, Dennis White, appeared in court today for sentencing and got quite the surprise. News 4's Luke Moretti reports. 36-year-old Dennis White is cuffed and taken to jail, but not before getting some heat from the bench. And I don't think he's taking this seriously. State Supreme Court Justice William Bowler says White did not fully cooperate with the probation department for a pre-sentencing report. So instead of getting only three years probation and walking out of the courtroom, White will also spend 60 days in jail. I gave your client an opportunity for probation. I don't want to have all this extra trouble if he would have just complied with the simple lawful request of the probation officer, he'd have had his probation conditions and he would have walked away. Erie County District Attorney John Flynn wanted jail time all along for White. This guy has a cavalier attitude. He's quite frankly, in my opinion, a punk. In essence, he'll do his two, uh, uh, 60 days and then he'll have probation for two years and 10 months. He also has a five-year order of protection um, uh, with the, the victims here. So he can't go near the victims, near their home uh, for five years. Let's go, buddy. Why do you have a gun drawn? Please put that gun. White was one of two bounty hunters involved in a midnight raid in South Buffalo a little more than a year ago. They searched the duplex of the fugitive's brother, but the fugitive wasn't there and never lived there. White was charged and eventually pleaded guilty to criminal trespass, menacing, endangering the welfare of a child, and criminal mischief. A second bounty hunter was never charged in the raid that terrified two young families and their children. D.A. Flynn says that's because they can't prove who he is. I think I know who it is, all right? So, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure who it is. It's just a matter of I can't go in a court beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law and prove who it is. Dennis White's attorney tells News 4 that he's reviewing whether to appeal the sentence. A federal civil lawsuit sparked by the bounty hunter raid is pending. Luke Moretti, News 4. Still to come tonight at 6, from passing bills on Capitol Hill to battling Parkinson's here in western New York, Dave Graber speaks with former Congressman Jack Quinn in a News 4 special report when we come back.
For the past six years, the Buffalo Gym has been giving hundreds of people with Parkinson's a new lease on life. And now they're expanding again to bring their one of a kind training to new clients. One of them is former Buffalo Congressman Jack Quinn, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's about eight years ago. News 4's Dave Graber shows us how the gym gets results. This is not your normal gym. And these are not your typical gym rats. In fact, some of them arrived here in a wheelchair or with the use of a walker. That's to say they started coming that way. But now... And let's do 12 more. Well, you get the idea. Among Parkinson's boxing, more than 200 weekly clients and biggest cheerleaders is Jack Quinn, the larger-than-life Republican congressman who for six terms on Capitol Hill represented Buffalo, parts of the South Towns, in Chautauqua County. For 12 years, he battled for Western New York. For 10 years after that, he fought for students and staff as the president of ECC. But it was during the end of his term leading the college that Quinn would face a new battle, one with which he was surprisingly all too familiar. I went for a neuropathy in my feet. On Christmas Eve morning, eight years ago, doctors would tell Quinn the tingling sensation in his feet and a shaky thumb wasn't the result of diet or lack of sleep. And uh, he said, you know, you got Parkinson's. But after he looked at me for a while, he saw me dragging my right leg, had a small tremor in one of my thumbs, and didn't know where it came from. I thought pinched nerve, uh, you know, not getting enough sleep. Quinn had long been a pillar of the Western New York community, incredibly well-known, driven, busy and proud. He would say years later, too proud. Yeah, I just frankly, it was a personal decision, did not, did not want to share that with the public. Um, sometimes people look at you when you've got something wrong with you that it's worse than what it really is. And having had my brother Jeff go through that, I decided just to tamp it down and not tell anybody. My wife, my brother, and my two kids knew. Quinn may have been quiet about his diagnosis, but he wasn't alone. Two of Quinn's brothers also have Parkinson's, including his younger brother, Jeff. Oddly, experience was on his side. At the time, there was lots of little tricks that you learned from people who already had it. You parked the car closer. You remember where you parked the car, uh, number, number one. Uh, you don't hold the microphone when you're speaking. You put it on a podium so it's hands off and nothing starts to move. Three years later, a change of heart, thanks to his inner circle. They said, listen, you're not going to get the help you need, whether it's boxing or whether it's your neurologist or whether whoever it is, you're not going to get the help you need if you keep this a secret. No longer keeping family, friends, and colleagues in the dark, Quinn, now 70, turned to what he knew best, fighting for causes in our nation's capital. Except now he's fighting harder for the cause of Parkinson's than he ever did for Western New York. So those are the tools I have that I know how to do, and I might as well put them to work for other people. Had you ever put forth or got involved in a piece of legislation that meant more to you? <laughs> if I did, I don't remember it. He lobbied for increased government funding, helped to establish a national Parkinson's registry, and was elected to the board of the Michael J. Fox Foundation last May. And Quinn Box. When you realize the severity of this disease, and the fact that there's no cure, and it's degenerative. Uh, no matter who's got it, <laughs> yeah, you've got some work to cut out for you. And we have found, I have found, as a citizen, as a person, that this program works. He started with simple exercises, added a medicine ball, and then fielded questions from his trainer and brother Jeff, all while standing on a BOSA ball. And when you do those repetitively, you find out at home your memory's a little bit better. You don't have to walk so slowly around some corners. You can get in and out of a car a little bit more easily. The methods used at Parkinson's boxing have shown to drastically reduce patient falls and their reliance on meds, as well as improve overall balance and eliminate the common shuffling gait associated with the disease. Workouts are tailored to each client, and the results are intricately tracked by gym president and owner Dean Iwanu. The skill sets have to fit together cognitively through meaningful learning to build a new brain map on new real estate of that brain. And, and once you figure it out and see the results, it's insane. 
Dean spent more than a decade training fighters at the University of Buffalo. Six years ago, he went from working with D1 athletes in their physical prime to changing the lives of people just looking to make it down a flight of stairs. When you compare what you would get out of these prime athletes to, to what you get out of these older men and women. No comparison. There's no comparison. Why? Because you're changing people's lives, you're changing caregivers' lives, you're changing families' lives, you're changing the individual's lives. If you heard the stories we heard, they tell them there's nothing you can do. Go home, there's nothing you can do. And these same people that they tell them to, we have climbing, rock climbing, they're hiking, they're riding bikes, they're swimming, they're, they're, they're living their lives, they're, they're playing golf. It doesn't get any better. Quinn knows this firsthand. And the fact that Jeff is by his side throughout it all makes it even more rewarding. As a congressman and college president, Quinn is used to having a staff, a gaggle of advisors. But the people surrounding Quinn now, like Jeff and Dean, are responsible for his quality and longevity of life. Outside of perhaps your wife and maybe your children, are there two other people in this world that you are more thankful for given your life? <laughs> this guy. This guy. You need help. So we can help others. The way Quinn sees it, he has two choices. And I think that unless you want to crawl in a hole and, and, and do nothing for the rest of your life, we, we've got to do this. Somebody's got to do it. We've got to get some help with it. Now, Parkinson's Boxing has been working with local insurance providers like Independent Health and Blue Cross Blue Shield to allow their clients to be covered for these workouts. In most cases, clients can work out at the gym for a very minimal cost. And with Jack Quinn's help, Dean and his trainers are working to not only expand the gym's brand, but the coverage for its clients. In the studio tonight, Dave Graber, News 4. Dave, thank you. And if you know Jack Quinn, you know a gentleman's gentleman. He's done so much for our community, and it's great to see he still has that fighting spirit. Go well, my friend. Certainly. What a story. Well, let's switch over to the weather now. You know, when we look at the mess we've had over the past couple 24 hours, at least we're going to see some sunshine this weekend. We'll see some sunshine, and I at least wanted to kind of reassure some of the skiers and snowboarders that the ski slopes still look pretty good. All of the cameras I've pulled up still show a considerable snowpack in place. Uh, Holiday Valley wasn't reporting any new snow as of this morning, but I do expect to find at least a little bit there overnight tonight. A couple of inches just to freshen things up, but it does look pretty decent out there, considering that we just dealt with over an inch worth of rain. Uh, and a huge snow melt across all of western New York. I mean, I, just the snowpack analysis today looked completely different than it did just two days ago. So as far as what we're looking for tonight, one thing to keep in mind is the wind. And that's the one thing for especially uh, those who want to be out on skis tomorrow. The wind advisory goes from 1 o'clock in the morning, when you're probably still sleeping, through 1 p.m. tomorrow. And all the areas where you see that tan color are probably some of the best chance spots to find gusts to 50 and 55 miles per hour. Why are Cattaraugus and Allegheny not included in this? Well, the terrain here is basically favoring wind gusts potential of 40 to 45 miles per hour. So it's just below what it takes to trigger the advisory. So there's the answer to that. Um, this wind is also what's going to be driving that water rise on Lake Erie. And that's a heads up for those of you who live right on the edge of the lake shore. Uh, it used to be an issue more toward Route 5 and say, uh, you know, Hoax Restaurant and may get water up into the parking lots, sort of those sort of areas. Uh, but even some of the neighborhoods there, it's something to keep in mind uh, for tonight through early tomorrow morning. The gusts right now are already noticeable. We've had some gusts into the 30 mile per hour range, 31 in Buffalo within the last hour. I expect to see those gusts building overnight tonight. Um, there's 5 a.m. You see some gusts into the 40s. Uh, it's not out of the question to find some of those gusts to around 50. This model is a little bit low on some of the gusts, but I at least want to mention it because if you're going to be outside tomorrow, you can see some 50s there showing up at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, you're going to want to at least know that it's going to be a windy sort of day out there. Sunday, we're still likely to find gusts to around 30, but not quite as bad. Temperature wise, these numbers are continuing to drop at least for now. And I say that and it sounds obvious because it's 620 in the evening, uh, but this is one of these nights where 
after you get past about 10, 11 o'clock, temperatures will start climbing again. So I do think Buffalo, Brand, uh, Dunkirk will all get down into the upper teens. So we have a couple more degrees to go. And then as this next system approaches, those temperatures will start climbing again. So yes, we have a minor opportunity for a few flakes now and another chance it'll show up during the early morning hours. Uh, for most of us, it's closer toward 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. This is that chance to bring some additional snow even down toward Holiday Valley and actually all ski areas around our area. Uh, and then get in tomorrow afternoon. You may find a few flakes in the hills, but in general, the afternoon should be quieter. The wind will slowly fade a little bit. Sunday looks at least a little bit nicer as far as the sunshine is concerned, and it will be a bit warmer out there. So for snowfall numbers, they're minor by our standards, but keep in mind when you're talking about wind gusts to 50 miles per hour, that's going to be blowing some of the snow around and making it a little tough to travel during the early morning hours. Something to keep in mind out there. Uh, I'd say beyond that, uh, it's just, you know, additional minor coatings for many areas, especially once you get outside of the hills. There's that warmer Sunday with sunshine. Those uh, milder temperatures continue into early next week. Rain for Tuesday. We'll get back into some flakes later on in the week. Don, Jordan. Thanks, Todd. Straight ahead, the Bandits get ready to host the Albany Firewolves, and their best player just happens to be from Western New York. Heather is here. Sports is next. Now, News 4 Sports with Heather Prusak.
As the Bandits host the Albany Firewolves tonight, a familiar face and Western New York native returns to Banditland. Joe Reseteritz played for Buffalo back in 2014. His older brother Frank did as well back in the day. He's from Hamburg and not only Albany's best player, but one of the top scorers in the NLL. He has 20 goals and 47 points in eight games, both good for top five in the league. He ended with four goals and six assists in last Last week's loss to Rochester. He's got at least two points in every game so far this season, and the Bandits know it's a challenge to limit his production. He's having an unbelievable season. He was in my draft year. I, I remember the everybody talking about him being from Buffalo and him probably going to Buffalo. I'm, I was lucky enough to kind of get drafted here, and we always tease about it. He's a good friend of mine. Um, he's one of the best American lacrosse players that's ever played in the NLL. So he's one of those guys that you got to you, you're not going to stop him completely, but you got to slow him down. And I think our defense is looking forward to, to that challenge. You know, when a guy's leading their offense, and he, you know, he's just had a hot stick lately. Um, you know, it, it's just we just got to limit his time and space. Um, I've known Joe for years. Uh, you know, he grew up playing in St. Catharines, my hometown. My brother's coached him. So I've, I've, I've known him for a long time, and I've seen him play at a high level f uh, for a long time, whether it was there or in Rochester. So, yeah, he's going he's gonna to find the back of the net. we just got to limit his time and space and, and make things a little bit harder on him um, because he's going to get his look because he's a great player. Buffalo 6-1 and one on the season. Looking to add to that tonight against Albany. Faceoff is at 7.30. As for the Sabres, Buffalo's coming off a 3-1 loss to Ottawa last night. Even though the Sabres got on the board first, the Senators really took control in the third period. Buffalo also only went 1-6 for six on the power play, so a lot of missed opportunities in that one. Up next, they host Colorado tomorrow at 1. Heather Prusak, News 4 Sports. And thanks for watching News 4 at 6. We'll be back at 10 and 11. For more local news, join Dave and me over on the CW23 for News 4 at 7. Have a great night.
Live to tell us what's next. Chris.
For the past six years, the Buffalo Gym has been giving hundreds of people with Parkinson's a new lease on life. And now they're expanding again to bring their one of a kind training to new clients. One of them is former Buffalo Congressman Jack Quinn, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's about eight years ago. News 4's Dave Graber shows us how the gym gets results. This is not your normal gym. And these are not your typical gym rats. In fact, some of them arrived here in a wheelchair or with the use of a walker. That's to say they started coming that way. But now... And let's do 12 more. Well, you get the idea. Among Parkinson's boxing, more than 200 weekly clients and biggest cheerleaders is Jack Quinn, the larger-than-life Republican congressman who for six terms on Capitol Hill represented Buffalo, parts of the South Towns, and Chautauqua County. For 12 years, he battled for Western New York. For 10 years after that, he fought for students and staff as the president of ECC. But it was during the end of his term leading the college that Quinn would face a new battle, one with which he was surprisingly all too familiar. I went for a neuropathy in my feet. On Christmas Eve morning, eight years ago, doctors would tell Quinn the tingling sensation in his feet and a shaky thumb wasn't the result of diet or lack of sleep. And uh, he said, you know, you got Parkinson's. But after he looked at me for a while, he saw me dragging my right leg, had a small tremor in one of my thumbs, and didn't know where it came from. I thought pinched nerve, uh, you know, I get enough sleep. Quinn had long been a pillar of the Western New York community, incredibly well-known, driven, busy and proud. He would say years later, too proud. Yeah, I just frankly, it was a personal decision, did not, did not want to share that with the public. Um, sometimes people look at you when you've got something wrong with you that it's worse than what it really is. And having had my brother Jeff go through that, I decided just to tamp it down and not tell anybody. My wife, my brother, and my two kids knew. Quinn may have been quiet about his diagnosis, but he wasn't alone. Two of Quinn's brothers also have Parkinson's, including his younger brother, Jeff. Oddly, experience was on his side. At the time, there was lots of little tricks that you learned from people who already had it. You parked the car closer. You, you remember where you parked the car, uh, number, number one. Uh, you don't hold the microphone when you're speaking. You put it on the podium so it's hands off and nothing starts to move. Three years later, a change of heart, thanks to his inner circle. They said, listen, you're not going to get the help you need, whether it's boxing or whether it's your neurologist or whether whoever it is, you're not going to get the help you need if you keep this a secret. No longer keeping family, friends, and colleagues in the dark, Quinn, now 70, turned to what he knew best, fighting for causes in our nation's capital. Except now he's fighting harder for the cause of Parkinson's than he ever did for Western New York. So those are the tools I have that I know how to do, and I might as well put them to work for other people. Had you ever put forth or got involved in a piece of legislation that meant more to you? <laughs> if I did, I don't remember it. He lobbied for increased government funding, helped to establish a national Parkinson's registry, and was elected to the board of the Michael J. Fox Foundation last May. And Quinn Box. When you realize the severity of this disease, and the fact that there's no cure, and it's degenerative. Uh, no matter who's got it, <laughs> uh, you've got some work to cut out for you. And we have found, I have found, as a citizen, as a person, that this program works. He started with simple exercises, added a medicine ball, and then fielded questions from his trainer and brother Jeff, all while standing on a BOSA ball. And when you do those repetitively, you find out at home your memory's a little bit better. You don't have to walk so slowly around some corners. You get in and out of a car a little bit more easily. The methods used at Parkinson's boxing have shown to drastically reduce patient falls and their reliance on meds, as well as improve overall balance and eliminate the common shuffling gait associated with the disease. Workouts are tailored to each client, and the results are intricately tracked by gym president and owner Dean Iwanu. The skill sets have to fit together cognitively through meaningful learning to build a new brain map on new real estate of that brain. And, and once you figure it out and see the results, it's insane. 
Dean spent more than a decade training fighters at the University of Buffalo. Six years ago, he went from working with D1 athletes in their physical prime to changing the lives of people just looking to make it down a flight of stairs. When you compare what you would get out of these prime athletes to, to what you get out of these older men and women. No comparison. There's no comparison. Why? Because you're changing people's lives, you're changing caregivers' lives, you're changing families' lives, you're changing the individuals' lives. If you heard the stories we heard, they tell there's nothing you can do. Go home, and there's nothing you can do. These same people that they tell them to, we have climbed rock climbing, they're hiking, they're riding bikes, they're swimming, they're, they're, they're living their lives, they're, they're playing golf. It doesn't get any better. Quinn knows this firsthand. And the fact that Jeff is by his side throughout it all makes it even more rewarding. As a congressman and college president, Quinn is used to having a staff, a gaggle of advisors. But the people surrounding Quinn now, like Jeff and Dean, are responsible for his quality and longevity of life. Outside of perhaps your wife and maybe your children, are there two other people in this world that you are more thankful for given your life? <laughs> this guy. This guy. You need help. So we can help others. The way Quinn sees it, he has two choices. And I think that unless you want to crawl in a hole and, and, and do nothing for the rest of your life, we, we've got to do this. Somebody's got to do it. We've got to get some help with it. Now, Parkinson's Boxing has been working with local insurance providers like Independent Health and Blue Cross Blue Shield to allow their clients to be covered for these workouts. In most cases, clients can work out at the gym for a very minimal cost. And with Jack Quinn's help, Dean and his trainers are working to not only expand the gym's brand, but the coverage for its clients. In the studio tonight, Dave Graber, News 4. Dave, thank you. And if you know Jack Quinn, you know a gentleman's gentleman. He's done so much for our community, and it's great to see he still has that fighting spirit. Go well, my friend. Certainly. What a story. Well, let's switch over to the weather now. You know, when we look at the mess we've had over the past couple 24 hours, at least we're going to see some sunshine this weekend. We'll see some sunshine, and I at least wanted to kind of reassure some of the skiers and snowboarders that the ski slopes still look pretty good. All of the cameras I've pulled up still show a considerable snowpack in place. Uh, Holiday Valley wasn't reporting any new snow as of this morning, but I do expect to find at least a little bit there overnight tonight. A couple of inches just to freshen things up, but it does look pretty decent out there, considering that we just dealt with over an inch worth of rain uh, and a huge snow melt across all of western New York. I mean, I, just the snowpack analysis today looked completely different than it did just two days ago. So as far as what we're looking for tonight, one thing to keep in mind is the wind. And that's the one thing for especially uh, those who want to be out on skis tomorrow. The wind advisory goes from 1 o'clock in the morning, when you're probably still sleeping, through 1 p.m. tomorrow. And all the areas where you see that tan color are probably some of the best chance spots to find gusts to 50 and 55 miles per hour. Why are Cataraugus and Allegheny not included in this? Well, the terrain here is basically favoring wind gusts potential of 40 to 45 miles per hour. So it's just below what it takes to trigger the advisory. So there's the answer to that. Um, this wind is also what's going to be driving that water rise on Lake Erie. And that's a heads up for those of you who live right on the edge of the lake shore. Uh, it used to be an issue more toward Route 5 and say, uh, you know, Hoax Restaurant and may get water up into the parking lots, so those sort of areas. Uh, but even some of the neighborhoods there, it's something to keep in mind uh, for tonight through early tomorrow morning. The gusts right now are already noticeable. We've had some gusts into the 30 mile per hour range, 31 in Buffalo within the last hour. I expect to see those gusts building overnight tonight. Um, there's 5 a.m. You see some gusts into the 40s. Uh, it's not out of the question to find some of those gusts around 50. This model is a little bit low on some of the gusts, but I at least want to mention it because if you're going to be outside tomorrow, you can see some 50s there showing up at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, you're going to want to at least know that it's going to be a windy sort of day out there. Sunday, we're still likely to find gusts to around 30, but not quite as bad. Temperature wise, these numbers are continuing to drop at least for now. And I say that and it sounds obvious because it's 620 in the evening, uh, but this is one of these nights where 
after you get past about 10, 11 o'clock, temperatures will start climbing again. So I do think Buffalo, Brand, uh, Dunkirk will all get down into the upper teens. So we have a couple more degrees to go. And then as this next system approaches, those temperatures will start climbing again. So yes, we have a minor opportunity for a few flakes now and another chance it'll show up during the early morning hours. Uh, for most of us, it's closer toward 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. This is that chance to bring some additional snow even down toward Holiday Valley and actually all ski areas around our area. Uh, and then get in tomorrow afternoon. You may find a few flakes in the hills, but in general, the afternoon should be quieter. The wind will slowly fade a little bit. Sunday looks at least a little bit nicer as far as the sunshine is concerned, and it will be a bit warmer out there. So for snowfall numbers, they're minor by our standards, but keep in mind when you're talking about wind gusts of 50 miles per hour, that's going to be blowing some of the snow around and making it a little tough to travel during the early morning hours. Something to keep in mind out there. Uh, I'd say beyond that, uh, it's just, you know, additional minor coatings for many areas, especially once you get outside of the hills. There's that warmer Sunday with sunshine. Those uh, milder temperatures continue into early next week. Rain for Tuesday. We'll get back into some flakes later on in the week. Don Jordan. Thanks, Todd. Straight ahead, the Bandits get ready to host the Albany Firewolves, and their best player just happens to be from Western New York. Heather is here. Sports is next. Now, News 4 Sports with Heather Prusak. 
As the Bandits host the Albany Firewolves tonight, a familiar face and Western New York native returns to Banditland. Joe Reseteritz played for Buffalo back in 2014. His older brother Frank did as well back in the day. He's from Hamburg and not only Albany's best player, but one of the top scorers in the NLL. He has 20 goals and 47 points in eight games, both good for top five in the league. He ended with four goals and six assists in last Last week's loss to Rochester. He's got at least two points in every game so far this season, and the Bandits know it's a challenge to limit his production. He's having an unbelievable season. He was in my draft year. I, I remember the everybody talking about him being from Buffalo and him probably going to Buffalo. I'm, I was lucky enough to kind of get drafted here, and we always tease about it. He's a good friend of mine. Um, he's one of the best American lacrosse players that's ever played in the NLL. So he's one of those guys that you got to you, you're not going to stop him completely, but you got to slow him down. And I think our defense is looking forward to, to that challenge. You know, when a guy's leading their offense and he, you know, he's just had a hot stick lately. Um, you know, it's it's just we just got to limit his time and space. Um, I've known Joe for years. Uh, you know, he grew up playing in St. Catharines, my hometown. My brother's coached him. So I've, I've, I've known him for a long time, and I've seen him play at a high level f uh, for a long time, whether it was there or in Rochester. So, yeah, he's going to he's gonna find the back of the net. we just got to limit his time and space and, and make things a little bit harder on him um, because he's going to get his look because he's a great player. Buffalo 6-1 and one on the season. Looking to add to that tonight against Albany. Faceoff is at 7.30. As for the Sabres, Buffalo's coming off a 3-1 loss to Ottawa last night. Even though the Sabres got on the board first, the Senators really took control in the third period. Buffalo also only went one for six on the power play, so a lot of missed opportunities in that one. You're watching News 4, your local news leader. Now, live from Buffalo, this is News 4 at 7. Thank you for joining us for News 4 at 7. I'm Dave Graber. And I'm Jordan Orcas. Here are some of the stories we're bringing you this hour. Coming up, heavy rain turns to snow and ice. Leaving rivers jammed and roads slick this evening, we continue our team coverage of this wild weather in western New York. And we're not done with all this weather yet. We have another system passing through, bringing some snow and also windy conditions. More details coming up. Plus, the contentious relationship between the Buffalo Teachers Federation and the district continues. As the union votes, they have no confidence in Superintendent Dr. Kreiner Cash. Well, Western New York is still right smack dab in the middle of a roller coaster weather forecast. That's right. News for Sarah Minkowitz went out to the town of Evans, where they're under a state of emergency and a lot of water. 
There is still an ice jam here at Big Sister Creek off of Route 5 in the town of Evans, and that's what's causing the water to spill over onto people's property inside their homes. The water has gone down a bit, but as you can see, it is still flooded over here. And if you take a look at the trees where the ice is, that's how high the water was at one point. People who live in this area tell me it's been a while since it's been this bad. This is uh, probably the worst I've seen it. I've been living here for 40 years, so I, I, I know the crook pretty good. This week's warm up in temperatures caused this ice jam at Big Sister Creek near Route 5 in the town of Evans, and with it, major flooding. We are right now replacing the furnace and the hot water tank next door. Totally flooded in the basement, and uh, I don't know, they, they got to do something because this happens quite often. I mean, it probably hasn't been this bad in five years, but. It's pretty sad. Well, there's a lot of properties that are unfortunately getting affected. One basement collapsed. A um, few people drove around barricades. And so we're, we're, we are still worried about the low lying water. It's deeper than you think. The town closed off a section of Route 5 between Sturgeon Point and Beach Road. Town officials say it could be a while before these roads open back up. This is probably the worst it's been in a long time. Um, definitely the longest it's been. Um, two days and they don't like keeping route five shut so so it is it's it's definitely a major event we're hoping that mother nature just takes its course so we can clear this up but it doesn't look like that's going to happen today on friday the town declared a state of emergency as they deal with flooding and ice jams this this was extreme i think this was extreme for the residents we went through probably all of our supply of sandbags for our residents so um, and then we had electrical issues, flooding of basements. That all happens, and so we just have to be ready as a community. Town, just we're, we're, we got a plan, and we're sticking to it, and we're working with the state and the county, and we're, we're going to be able to get through this. The state of emergency is in effect through Sunday. For now, reporting in the town of Evans, Sarah Mikowitz, News 4. Well, cleanup in many houses continues tonight after some serious flooding in West Seneca's Lexington Green neighborhood, where about a half a dozen families had to be pulled from their homes late last night. Now, the water has receded off the road this evening, but plenty of frustration remains. This neighborhood sits right on the Buffalo Creek and saw some major flooding in 2014. After that, the town asked the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to help them address the problem. But in 2016, the Corps said a federal interest does not exist in pursuing a flood risk management study because of the cost. With the federal government, we have to make ensure that the, there's a benefit of every dollar of what a core project is to have a positive benefit to cost ratio. They came to the conclusion, you know, obviously we don't agree, but that um, that it, it wasn't cost effective. Now, Dixon says Buffalo Niagara Waterkeeper is looking into the idea of putting a flood bench near that neighborhood. And turning to your forewarned weather forecast right now, this is what it looks like outside at this hour. It looks pretty clear out there right now. Our meteorologist Jordan Jenna has everything you need to know as we head into the weekend. Jordan, what are we looking at? So right now we're getting a lull in the action, but we do now have another system approaching the area that will be impacting us mainly tonight. And then it will have some lingering impacts throughout the afternoon tomorrow. So we do have to look out for that flood warning all the way throughout tomorrow. For some areas, you can see some are going to cancel this evening. We also have a winter weather advisory in effect because of that that system in northern Pennsylvania. We're going to see some minor snow accumulation for a lot of areas. So this is the system in the upper Midwest. It's making its way into the Great Lakes region. It has a warm front and cold front associated with it. Snow, but its main impact is actually going to be the wind gusts as it passes throughout the area. So that's going to add to some snow blowing and some snow drifting. Wind gusts right now you can see are in the 20s and teens. So this is definitely calmer than what we're going to see. These are going to pick up past midnight and we're going to see wind sustained at 25 to 35 miles per hour. Wind gusts ranging from 50 to 55 miles per hour. Now wind advisory has been issued 1 a.m tonight through 1 p.m. tomorrow afternoon. So that's when we're expecting those winds to be a little, a little bit more hazardous. On the satellite and radar, we just have some lighter lake flurries continuing to pass through, beginning to dissipate. We are going to get a break in this action, like I said, in the next couple of hours, and then we'll see more snow coming past midnight. I'll have more details on that and what to expect with that as well in just a few. Jordan. Thanks, Jordan. And of course, to keep track of the latest forecast, download the Forewarn Weather app. You can find it in the App Store or on Google Play.
Well, in other news tonight, for the first time in the seven years as superintendent of Buffalo Public Schools, the Buffalo Teachers Federation has taken a no confidence vote on Dr. Kreiner Cash. After the violent attack at McKinley High last week, the union says Dr. Cash allowed the school to remain unsafe. While the BTF says it appreciates the many things that Cash has accomplished, the union also says he has allowed McKinley to go unchecked. Just hours later, Cash released his own statement saying in part, no performative tactics of the BTF or any other groups will deter my commitment to steering the Buffalo Public Schools through these challenging times, end quote. Meanwhile, Dr. Cash is still working to address the aftermath of the shooting and stabbing last week. That has to be <coughs> done again in haste, and it has to be done again thoroughly and up to best-in-class standards. That was not the case, uh, so that's what we're working on right now. Ultimately, it'll be up to the school board to decide whether cash stays or goes. The plan includes two additional school resource officers at McKinley, along with other security improvements there. Students at McKinley will return to in-person learning in phases starting on February 28th. Well, student and parent frustration over school mask mandates continues to build. Juliana Bruno spoke to districts in the capital region about where things stand heading into midwinter break. As much as we can, we look at any of these situations through those teacher lenses uh, to see how we can make the most of it. Um, but, the, but the challenges are, are there for sure. Dozens of Boston Spa High School students walked into school maskless last Thursday. The superintendent said things have pretty much gone back to normal since then. The next day we had some students who chose to continue the protest, but they stayed home or they went to the uh, rally in Albany. We were aware of that. But in the buildings themselves, that kind of consternation just hasn't continued. He maintained that two altercations among students on Tuesday are not indicative of tensions boiling over because of the mask mandate. At Mahanison Central School District, Superintendent Shannon Shine was made aware students would be staging a maskless walk-in protest this morning. He sent an email out to parents yesterday reminding them that cooperation from students has been part of what's allowed them to stay open for in-person learning for the last year plus. The difficulty becomes when parents direct their students uh, to be, you know, civilly disobedient and not wear the, the masks, and then we're put in that very awkward situation where the state has been very clear with us that it's still a mandate. He said only a handful of students ended up following through with the maskless walk-in, but the district had a plan in place that involved offering students face coverings and politely directing them to a common area with bathroom access while waiting for parents to pick them up. And I think the danger is that things could escalate and it's unnecessary. We don't want to escalate matters. Parents don't want matters escalated. Students don't want it escalated. So we're trying our very best uh, to remain calm, civil, respectful. All the things that uh, we teach our students, we need to model them. Well, just days before it was set to take effect, the State Department of Health is hitting the brakes on its booster mandate for health care workers. The state says it will not enforce the February 21st deadline for workers to get the extra dose. Now, the state says it made the move to avoid potential staffing issues and give health care workers more time to get boosted. The health department says around 75% of health care workers have received the booster or are willing to receive one. Coming up after the break, our Kayla Green has a heartwarming story about a boy's love for penguins and how he uses it to support the Aquarium of Niagara.
The Aquaparent program at the Aquarium in Niagara is a way to give back to conservation efforts in Adopt an Animal. News Force Kayla Green tells us about one boy who's dedicated his young life to protecting the penguins and can now call two of the aquarium's penguins his adopted babies. Adopting a penguin has never been easier here at the Aquarium of Niagara, and there's one boy who's going above and beyond with the two penguins that he adopted through the Aquaparent program. Wyatt Herschel has loved penguins since he was 11 months old. His mom held his birthday party at the National Aviary every year since he was seven. He asks for donations for penguins instead of gifts, raising between $600 and $1,000 each year. They've adopted 14 penguins so far, and this year, as a Valentine's Day gift, his mom adopted him a pair of penguins from the Aquarium of Niagara. She adopted these two guys, Nino and DJ. Aquarium CEO Gary Sedal says they love seeing the connections between the people and the animals. I guess I just love their cuteness, the way they waddle. I started hearing that it was um, important to help penguins. I just thought I'd help out. Our recent Adopt an Animal program was geared around couples of penguins or paired bonds, and we were able to provide an opportunity for him to adopt not only one, but two of our penguins together. And the combined effort of $7,000 being raised for the advocacy of aquatic birds, that's absolutely incredible, and we're so proud to be part of even that small moment. Last year, Wyatt was recognized as the youngest member of the National Aviary's Donor Society, raising $1,200 in 2021 alone. The Aquaparent program is donation-based. All the proceeds go back to the Aquarium of Niagara. You can adopt an animal through their website. In Niagara Falls, Kayla Green, News 4. I was going to say, look at that penguin <laughs> strutting its stuff, stuff in the background. <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty promising <laughs> walk right there, Dave. <laughs> Well, coming up, we are continuing our coverage of the snow and floods that have blown through parts of the region. Yeah, that's right. We uh, will also have your full forewarned weather forecast as we've got some lake enhanced snow showers making their way north. Jordan Jenna will be back to tell us how much more snow we can expect overnight.
Well, looking ahead to the weekend, you can cast out a fishing line for free. Tomorrow and Sunday is the first free wish fishing weekend of the year, meaning you can fish without a license. The next one isn't for another four months. Now, state officials are urging anglers to practice ice safety. And turning to the forecast, Jordan, really is not a good weekend for ice fishing mm -mm. at all. No, we have a lot going on. It's going to be really uncomfortable with the winds that are coming up. That'll be starting off tonight and lingering throughout the afternoon tomorrow. So looking at your satellite and radar right now, we do have some lake and lake enhanced blurries southern tier is remaining dry we will get a break from this as we step in the next couple of hours but we have another system that's approaching the area temperatures right now in the teens and 20s and these are actually going to be our lows we're going to increase in temperature as we step throughout the overnight hours as we get closer to sunrise we're going to be in the lower 20s and then unfortunately temperatures will drop from there we'll have decreasing daytime temperatures for tomorrow but for now current temperature in Brant is 19 17 in OEM we have 22 in Buffalo Metro 23 in Shingle House in Northern Pennsylvania and 16 in Climber. So we're definitely feeling the cold. The wind gusts are not that strong compared to definitely what we're going to see overnight tonight. So we have ranging in the teens to the upper 20s, closer to 28 degree, 28 miles per hour, excuse me, in the Buffalo Metro area. And we can see that as we get the system passed through, there is a wind advisory that has been issued with it. Around one o'clock overnight tonight, we are going to have that wind advisory take effect for all these counties that are shaded on the map. Winds are going to range 25 to 35 miles per hour with gusts ranging as high as 50 to 55 miles per hour. Now this advisory will take place all the way throughout tomorrow afternoon to look out for those winds. It looks like peak winds are going to be really past sunrise and then all the way throughout those early afternoon hours. So make sure you're watching out for that. It's going to feel very unbearable when it comes to walking outside in those cold temperatures and that wind. We also have to look out for some snow blowing and drifting that can make travels a little bit more hazard. So looking at your side Satellite radar right now. There's the system. It packs a punch with the wind. Doesn't have a whole lot of snow associated with it, but we will see some snow coming up for tonight. In terms of timing, you can already see past midnight. We're already increasing our temperature right near 20 degrees. As we get closer to 4 a.m., we have those scattered snow showers, incoming snow showers, 27, and then that's where we're going to reach our high in those upper 20s. And we're already beginning to dip into the lower 20s as we get closer to the 8 o'clock hour. That's when we're going to have that widespread lighter snow moving throughout the area. So we can check it out on your hour by hour. You can see that incoming system already approaching us. This is around midnight. We're still remaining dry, but check out these red arrows. They're really beginning to pick up with that system as it passes through. This is 4 o'clock a.m. tomorrow morning. You can see that widespread snow covering most of us around that hour and then it continues to pass through. This is 6 o'clock, so between two hours, that's when we're going to have a lot of the system pass through, but the winds are going to linger behind it. There will be scattered snow showers throughout the day for your forecast on Saturday. We'll have a lot of clouds and then we'll begin to see slightly calmer wind gusts as we step into the evening. Just nothing that will issue that alert that we have right now. So hour by hour forecast all the way into Sunday afternoon is we're going to see a lot more sunshine now coming up in your hour by hour snowfall. So by the time we get to tomorrow morning, we're going to see only a few inches of accumulation in the areas where you're seeing those darker shades of blue. That's going to add into accumulation throughout the day where a few more scattered snow showers pass through, but nothing crazy going on out there. We're going to see two to four at the most in those areas that are going to be in the darkest shades of blue. Tonight's temperatures 18 to 24. Like I said, decreasing throughout the day tomorrow. Watching out for that snow blowing. That's passing through with the winds and for that seven day forecast. We do have a lot of 40s coming up next week. 42 on Sunday, 46 on Monday and even 49 is great closer to Tuesday. Dave. Jordan, thank you straight ahead. An unlicensed bounty hunter learns his fate in court for terrorizing two families during a raid. We have an update on a story news for investigates first broke almost a year ago after the break.
Turning now to the latest on a story News 4 investigates first broke about a year ago. It involves a bounty hunter raid that terrified residents of a South Buffalo duplex. One of those bounty hunters, Dennis White, appeared in court today for sentencing and got quite the surprise. News 4's Luke Moretti reports. 36-year-old Dennis White is cuffed and taken to jail, but not before getting some heat from the bench. And I don't think he's taken this seriously. State Supreme Court Justice William Bowler says White did not fully cooperate with the probation department for a pre-sentencing report. So instead of getting only three years probation and walking out of the courtroom, White will also spend 60 days in jail. I gave your client an opportunity for probation. I don't want to have all this extra trouble if he would have just complied with the simple lawful request of the probation officer, he'd have had his probation conditions and he would have walked away. Erie County District Attorney John Flynn wanted jail time all along for White. This guy has a cavalier attitude. He's quite frankly, in my opinion, a punk. In essence, he'll do his two, uh, uh, 60 days and then he'll have probation for two years and 10 months. He also has a five-year order of protection um, uh, with the, the victims here. So he can't go near the victims, near their home uh, for five years. Let's go, buddy. Why do you have a gun drawn? Please put that gun. White was one of two bounty hunters involved in a midnight raid in South Buffalo a little more than a year ago. They searched the duplex of the fugitive's brother, but the fugitive wasn't there and never lived there. White was charged and eventually pleaded guilty to criminal trespass, menacing, endangering the welfare of a child, and criminal mischief. A second bounty hunter was never charged in the raid that terrified two young families and their children. D.A. Flynn says that's because they can't prove who he is. I think I know who it is, all right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure who it is. It's just a matter of I can't go in a court beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law and prove who it is. Dennis White's attorney tells News 4 that he's reviewing whether to appeal the sentence. A federal civil lawsuit sparked by the bounty hunter raid is pending. Luke Moretti, News 4. Still to come at 7, some local pharmacies are carrying the new COVID pills. Coming up, we'll tell you the reason those pharmacies may not be getting paid properly to distribute them.
You're watching News 4 at 7 with Jordan Norcus, Dave Graber, and Weather with Jordan Jenner. Communities all over Western New York got hit with flooding over the past 24 hours. This is video you're seeing here from Niagara County. And if you notice in that video, all of that water that was in front yards and backyards in that neighborhood has pretty much turned to ice. And I'll tell you what, Jordan, uh, what a difference 24 hours can make because right. we are going to have to deal with some cold temperatures, a little bit of snow, and then things go back up. Right, we're going to see a little bit of a warmer trend, but first we have to go through the system that's going to impact us, bringing us some snow. Its main driver, though, is a lot of wind associated with it, and that's going to happen tonight. So you can see this system in the upper lakes region. It's going to continue to make its way into western New York by the time we get closer to the midnight hour. So we're going to get a lull in the weather right now. Wind gusts are in the 20s, but we're going to also see these wind gusts pick up past midnight. That's also when the snow starts. We do have a wind advisory in effect 1 a.m. tonight throughout 1 p.m. tomorrow. So winds are expected to be 25 to 35 miles per hour, gusts 50 to 55 miles per hour. This is going to add to some snow drifting. This is going to add to some lakeshore flood watch that we have in with that wind pushing up along the lakes. And we're also looking out for some snow blowing as well. So if you're traveling during this time frame, we're going to definitely see a little bit more hazardous conditions on the roads, not because we're having a ton of snowfall tonight, but because of all that wind that's going to push that snow around as we're walking outside tomorrow. So wind gusts right now, like I said, in the teens and 20s, these are going to pick up past midnight. So you can check it out by the time we get to midnight. We're already seeing those 30s, but still mainly 20s. So pretty breezy and gusty out there, but check it out by the time we get to the 6 o'clock hour. We're already seeing some 50s on the board. This is going to be highest off towards the north and closer to the lake shores. And then you can see 40s for a lot of us, upper 30s in northern Pennsylvania around 1 o'clock tomorrow afternoon and a lot of 50s still coming up in their wind gusts forecast as well. All of additional details on what to expect with the temperature coming up. We're going to have another cold start to the weekend once again, but we do have a warmer trend coming up for next week. Dave. Jordan, thank you. It is a sigh of relief for many hospitals across the state. The Department of Health now says the booster mandate for health care workers will no longer go into effect on Monday. The state says it will reassess in three months. This comes after the Health Care Association of New York State asked for a 90 day extension. In a letter signed by 16 Republican senators to Governor Kathy Hochul saying nurse vacancies are too high. After walking through fire for us collectively for the last two years, they deserve much better than that. And uh, and again, you know, it just didn't make sense to say, well, we don't we'd rather not have you working in our hospitals if you don't get this booster. Um, so the Department of Health finally got this one right. New York State Health Commissioner Dr. Mary Bassett says 75% of health care workers have or are willing to get the booster, but this will give them more time to do so. A handful of pharmacies across the region now have access to new COVID pills. But as News Force Kelsey Anderson has learned, these pharmacies may not be getting paid properly to distribute them. At Kenmore Prescription Center, staff have been working long hours doing COVID testing, COVID vaccinations, and now distributing a new COVID antiviral pill. There are two of them, one made by Merck, the other by Pfizer. If patients take the pills within five days of symptoms, the medication is known to be effective in keeping them out of the hospital. This is a restricted medication. Uh, we are uh, one of a handful of pharmacies in Western New York that do have the medication available to their patients. Jeff Rutowski is part owner of the pharmacy. He receives the pills for free from the government. They give it to patients who have a prescription for free as well. But there's a cost for dispensing that medication, and he says they're not always getting paid that. Staff here researches every patient's medical history. These drugs cannot be taken if a person has a certain medical background. They make sure their patient is a good candidate for the pills. They also have to make sure the dosage is correct. In some cases, changing the dosage for certain people on other medications. All of that takes time, and time equals money because Rutowski has to pay his employees. Some studies have indicated that it costs anywhere from 10 to $15 per prescription over and above the product cost to remain viable. So who should pay that cost? Rutowski says if a patient is insured, that's on the insurance company. 
According to Rutowski, roughly 15% of insurance companies are reimbursing him no money at all, zero dollars to distribute that drug. He says more than 90% of insurance companies are reimbursing him $10 or less. Some insurance companies are willing to pay uh, a fair price for pharmacist services. Other, other insurance companies would rather use their money for, I don't know, naming stadiums after themselves or things like that. He says he's happy to provide patients with this medication and spend the time to do it. And he'll continue doing it. But as a small family-owned business, he says in order to keep the lights on, he needs proper reimbursement. In Kenmore, Kelsey Anderson, News 4. In other news tonight, in 2020, the U.S. reported nearly 11,000 cases of human trafficking. New York Democratic Senator Kirsten Gillibrand says Congress needs to do more to combat this issue. Gillibrand is pushing two bipartisan bills through the Senate. One would improve victim services, government training, and methods for tracking the problem. The other would expunge criminal records of trafficking victims for crimes like prostitution and money laundering. That would really allow them to start over with a clean slate. They should not be kept from rebuilding their lives because of the activities that their captors force them to engage in. Several Republicans have already said they support such action. Across the northern border, Canadian officials have arrested at least 70 protesters in Ottawa. Today, police began arrests and towing away trucks to break the three-week siege of Canada's capital by hundreds of truckers angry over the country's COVID-19 restrictions. This all comes after police made their first move to end the occupation yesterday, sealing off much of the downtown area. Police also arrested two protest leaders. Those two leaders were due in court today, facing charges of mischief and obstruction of police. U.S. officials have fanned out across Europe this weekend amid growing tension between Russia and Ukraine. They are working to build NATO solidarity and pushing for diplomacy as the world awaits Russia's next move. Skylar Henry reports from the White House. Air raid sirens filled the air in parts of eastern Ukraine Friday, and a bomb ripped through a car outside a government building. Pro-Russian rebels are ordering residents to load onto buses, evacuating them to Russia. There has been shelling in the region over the past few days, and U.S. officials have warned the simmering conflict here could be a spark for Russian attack. But Russian President Vladimir Putin said Friday his forces along Ukraine's border are there defensively. U.S. and European officials estimate they number about 190,000. Putin is also demanding NATO not allow Ukraine to join its alliance. Members of NATO and other world leaders are meeting in Germany, where Vice President Kamala Harris is pushing for diplomacy. We are also committed, if Russia takes aggressive action, to ensuring there will be severe consequences in terms of the economic sanctions we have discussed. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is visiting NATO countries. He's now in Lithuania, and earlier, he met with U.S. troops in Poland. Austin says he's seen no sign Russia is pulling back any of its troops. Moving closer to the border, uh, dispersal of troops, uh, increasing uh, logistical capabilities. Here at the White House, President Biden hosted a call with U.S. allies about the crisis in Ukraine. He believes a Russian attack could be imminent. We believe that they will target Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, a city of 2.8 million innocent people. If Russia pursues its plans, it will be responsible for a ca catastrophic and needless war of choice. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov have agreed to meet in Europe next week, but only if there's no invasion. Skyler Henry, CBS News, the White House. Up next, we introduce you to the young boy who has spent his life working to protect the penguins. And we'll show you how he's supporting local conservation efforts.
The Aquarium of Niagara's Aqua Parent Program is allowing people to adopt an animal and give back to conservation at the same time. News 4's Kayla Green tells us about one young boy who has dedicated his life to helping penguins and adopted two of the aquarium's finest and cutest. I just thought I'd help out. Wyatt Herschel has loved penguins for longer than he can remember. First time I ever saw penguins at the Pittsburgh Zoo down here. I, I saw the penguins and I was up against the glass for an hour. Ever since then, every, every time I've taken them to the zoo, I just plan on spending a good bit of time there. Every year since Wyatt turned seven, his mom Sherry holds his birthday party at the National Aviary. And that's not all. So I suggested uh, for his first birthday party that if people wanted to bring a small donation in addition to the gift, and it was actually his suggestion. He said, Mommy, I don't need any more toys. Why don't we just ask for money for the penguins? We have a little penguin that comes into the party room, and then we, bring, then we, instead of gifts, I ask everybody to donate to the penguins. Wyatt and Sherry have adopted 14 penguins from around the country, adding one from Niagara Falls to the list as a Valentine's gift. Wyatt adopted two of the penguins here in this exhibit through the Aqua Parent Program. The aquarium also offers other animals here to adopt, including sea lions, seals, and some of their fish. Our recent Adopt an Animal program was geared around couples of penguins, or paired bonds, and we were able to provide an opportunity for him to adopt not only one, but two of our penguins together. And the combined effort of $7,000 being raised for the advocacy of aquatic birds. That's absolutely incredible and we're so proud to be part of even that small moment. Gary Sadal is the president and CEO of the Aquarium of Niagara. He says adopting an animal is easy with the aquarium handling all the care. Wyatt's penguins are these cute guys, Nino and DJ. I guess I just love their cuteness, the way they waddle. Last year, Wyatt was recognized as the youngest member of the National Aviary's Donor Society, raising $1,200 in 2021 alone. Sherry says they visited the Aquarium of Niagara several times and are familiar with the penguins. I was happy for the opportunity to be able to support a pair of penguins and also um, add a little bit to Wyatt's collection of stuffed penguins, which has grown considerably over the years. Anyone interested in adopting an animal can head to AquariumOfNiagara.org. In Niagara Falls, Kayla Green, News 4. Coming up, we'll take a closer look at the safety of self-driving cars and the reason many automakers are seeing their systems stall.
your forewarned weather forecast. Certified Buffalo's most accurate with meteorologist Jordan Jenner. Well, turning now to our forewarned weather forecast and Jordan, as you can see behind you, looks like some of that snow we saw kind of during the dinner hour or a little bit before is kind of uh, moved out, uh, but there's more on the way. Yeah, these are leaked in flakes, lake enhanced flakes that are continuing to pass off the lakes, but you can see them begin to dissipate. We are going to have another system pass through tonight. That's going to bring us some widespread light snow showers. We are going to get a little bit more accumulation, a few inches across the region, but our main impact coming with this upcoming system is the wind. So we're going to have wind gusts ranging as high as 55 miles per hour. Currently our temperatures are in the teens and 20s. This is actually going to be our lows the linger in the teens and 20s, but we're going to start to increase as we get closer to the midnight hour. Temperatures will top off for our daytime highs tomorrow early in the morning. So we have a cold weekend ahead. By the end of it, we will see a warmer trend on the way. But first, let's talk about wind gusts. So you can see teens and 20s right now. These are going to pick up past midnight. We'll see 30s and 40s past midnight and then eventually those 50s. Now we do have a wind advisory in effect, so you can see in all those shaded counties, this is where this wind advisory takes place 1 a.m. tonight to tomorrow afternoon around 1 o'clock. We have sustained winds 25 to 35 miles per hour and we're watching out for those wind gusts. So as you can see, only a few counties are excluded from that. Here's a look at that system. It's a low pressure system. It has a couple different fronts associated with it. it. Doesn't carry a whole lot of snow, but it does carry those stronger winds. So looking at your forecast in terms of timing, we're already going to be on the increase around midnight. 20 degrees is the temperature, mostly cloudy skies. Incoming snow showers from there around 4 a.m. We'll have those scattered snow showers pass throughout the area. That's sitting at 27 degrees and already decreasing already around the 8 o'clock hour with widespread light snow showers and when that snow moves in our wind is also going to move in as well and we can check it out on your hour by hour forecast so remaining dry clouds begin to build past midnight and then the snow comes in so at 4 a.m. we're already seeing many counties covered in that widespread snow clouds are continuing off towards the south and then you can see from four to six this is when the bulk of the snow is going to pass through. So most of the accumulation we're going to see as we step into the weekend is really going to happen tonight into early tomorrow morning and check out those wind vectors as well. Those red rushing arrows, good indicator of how fast those winds are continuing to push through. We're going to see scattered snow showers throughout the rest of the morning hours that will linger into the early afternoon. A little bit more sunshine is coming up in the forecast for your Sunday and we're going to see a little bit more mild temperatures. But first we have cooler weather on the way with that snow and that wind that we have to do with when it's all said and done. This is a look at terms of the numbers one to two inches for many areas, a trace in other that doesn't have as much shading. You can see a little bit higher in some areas two to four. This will grow throughout the day tomorrow and then we'll see some areas that could have that three range, especially in those right around that area where you're seeing that darker shades of blue that could be around three to four inches of accumulation as well. Tonight, 18 to 24 is the temperature range. We'll see some blowing snow with these winds to watch out for. That will really impact us during commutes tomorrow. If you're heading out for any errands, we do have to look out for those hazards. 21 to 26, this will be early in the morning, probably around the seven o'clock hour, and then we'll see decreasing temperatures throughout the day. Here's a look at that seven day forecast. So like I said, warmer trend on the way and it starts on Sunday later in the day and then we're going to see 40s continue throughout there 46 on Monday 49 on Tuesday and of course rains coming up in there too. Jordan, thank you. The industrial sector is one of the most polluting industries in the U.S. That's why the Biden administration announced new plans to help clean up industrial emissions. Alexandra Limon has the details. The Biden administration announced two new initiatives to clean up emissions from the industrial sector, which is one of the leading sources of U.S. emissions. It is the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in, in the country and in the world. The administration says $9.5 billion from the bipartisan infrastructure law will be used on clean hydrogen projects, and that will help reduce pollution from things like steel manufacturing. Jason Walsh, executive director of the Blue Green Alliance, says the U.S. government is the single biggest consumer in the world. So it has the power to move markets. And that's why the Biden administration is also launching its Buy Clean Task Force to prioritize purchasing U.S.-made products with lower carbon footprints. Republican Senator John Cornyn says the country needs to proceed with caution. If we're not careful, we'll end up like uh, Europe, which uh, decommissioned their coal plants and their nuclear plants and now find a shortage of natural gas and energy. 
But Walsh says the new programs are only the tip of the iceberg to clean up the industrial sector, and a lot more work remains to be done. Making sure that all of the companies that bid to the U.S. government actually have a way of calculating the emissions that are embodied in the products that they are selling to the federal government. We've got to get that right. In Washington, Alexandra Limon. U.S. regulators are looking into claims of phantom braking in Tesla's Model 3 and Model Y. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says it's received hundreds of complaints from drivers saying their vehicles suddenly slowed or stopped for no apparent reason while using autopilot. But well, Tesla isn't the only of the automakers hitting some speed bumps in their self-driving systems. Naomi Ruckham has the results of a AAA study that finds some technologies are better than others. Many new cars today can do some of the driving for you. When the steering wheel turns green and things look safe, let go. Cadillac's Super Cruise technology lets you take your hands off the wheel, but a camera makes sure your eyes are on the road. Other semi-autonomous cars, including Teslas and certain Hyundai models, can steer and brake on their own, but still require drivers to keep their hands on the wheel and send an alert if they are two hands off. The system will warn you with the message, keep hands on steering wheel. It can be something that takes some stress out of driving, but it can't be over relied on. Greg Brannon is with AAA, which tested two of the monitoring technologies these cars use. The first is an indirect system that senses if hands are on the wheel. Those drivers were able to keep their hands off for several seconds while looking down. The second system uses cameras, and those drivers were warned sooner to look at the road. The cameras are, are much more effective, in fact, about five times more effective uh, than the indirect systems. Why is it better to have an actual camera than just monitoring where your hands are? The, the, the reason is that it's very simple for someone to have their head down and occasionally then just tug on the steering wheel and basically defeat the indirect systems that don't have a camera. In the study, indirect systems allow drivers to go up to six miles without paying much attention. How much of the responsibility really falls on the driver? Well, let's be clear, all of the responsibility right now falls on the driver. Brandon says the technology can help drivers, but can't replace them. Naomi Ruckham, CBS News, New York. Still ahead, this may sound cheesy, but Food Network is showing some love for Western New York cuisine. We'll tell you the local staple that's making national rankings. A favorite Buffalo restaurant is getting some high praise from Food Network. A dish from Chef's Italian Restaurant made the list of the best pasta in America. Of course, Chef's famous spaghetti parm listed as number 97 on the list of the best pasta in the nation. The owners say they are proud of the recognition by the Food Network. And it's a great review of their signature dish. Chef's has been in town for nearly 100 years. And if you have not had the spaghetti parm yet, you are missing out. It is fantastic. It is on my list. Got to have it. Oh, it's good.